John Green, welcome to the Live Wire House Party. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Can you, for folks that may be unfamiliar with the term, can you uh, kind of explain what Anthropocene actually means? Yeah, I probably should have chosen a title for this book that was e- either easy to spell or easy to pronounce or that, you know, had a, had a settled <laughs> definition, but there's there's no looking back now. The Anthropocene is a, it's a proposed term for our current geologic age in which humans have become not just like the dominant species on the planet, but but a geologically significant phenomenon with our, you know, tremendous interventions into the landscape, reshaping the planet's biodiversity and so on. And I took that as my starting point because I wanted to write a, a very personal book, but I also wanted to write a book about how weird it is to live in this historical moment when we are at once hugely powerful as a species, unprecedentedly powerful, but at the same time, like not nearly powerful enough. So together, we're doing all of this stuff that's having a huge impact on the entire planet and on every living being on the planet. But then like as an individual, I can't even like convince my children to eat breakfast. You've written some really successful books of fiction, Turtles All the Way Down and The Fault in Our Stars. Uh, In this book, though, you say that talking about yourself in the context of fiction had become exhausting. What did you mean by that? Well... When I'm writing a novel, I'm not really writing about or even for myself. I'm I'm writing. I'm trying to imagine what it's like to be someone else, and and th- th- that's its own creative enterprise. But then often, when you get asked, like in interviews and stuff, to talk about the book, they always want you to do it in the context of yourself, which I totally understand. Like, I enjoy listening to interviews, and the parts of interviews that are good are not the parts where the author is like carefully delineating the difference between the novel and the author or whatever. (laughs) It's the part where like the author is bearing their soul. And so Mm -hmm. I I totally get it. But for me, it had become, it had started to feel almost like, you know, fiction is written in code. And I'm the only person who, who knows the code, knows the relationship between myself and the story. And it had started to feel like other people thought they knew that code. And I just found the whole process of trying to navigate that, like in both The Fault in Our Stars and Turtles All the Way Down, I was trying to navigate that. I was aware of the fact that people were going to read me into the story, and I was trying to think about how to deal with it. And then after Turtles All the Way Down came out, I had sort of a serious health scare. And when I was recovering from that, I realized that I just didn't want to write in code anymore. I wanted to try to write directly about myself and 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 really kind of for myself, not least because... I needed to write my way back into hope, like Mm. hope that the species is worthwhile, hope that my life can be worthwhile. And I wanted to remind myself of the, you know, the importance of connection between people, the importance, the the incredible human capacity for wonder, for awe, for joy, all of that stuff I'd become pretty distant from. And so I wrote this book for for me. This is the Livewire House Party. We are talking to John Green. His new book is The Anthropocene Reviewed. He also has a great podcast of the same name. And the conceit of the podcast and also this book is is rating things (laughs) on a a kind of one to five star scale. What I think is interesting is you also write that those rating systems are pretty ineffective, you think. I mean, when you were writing book reviews, you said you thought that the the review itself was much more useful to the person who might read the book than just some kind of weird listing of stars. And yet you're using it as a conceit for all of this. Yeah. I mean, the thing about the five-star scale is that it's ridiculous, but it's also in- indispensable, which <laughs> is a lot like a lot of things in our current age. Like, yeah, I used to write 175-word book reviews for a living, and I didn't need to put a star review at the end of it because you could figure out whether the book was good from the review, hopefully. But the star system doesn't exist for humans. It exists for these data aggregation systems that are trying to use single data points to figure out the quality of a restaurant or a barbershop, or now like increasingly absurd things, like there are thousands of reviews of national parks and one of the things that actually spurred this book in the first place was my brother and I were on tour in 2017 and we were driving through Badlands National Park and we would read back and forth to each other the one star Google reviews of Badlands <laughs> National Park. And they were just so absurd. Like one 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 star review read in its entirety, 
not enough mountain. And like, <laughs> I don't think you can hold a national park responsible for not having mountains. I don't think that's the national park's fault. If you wanted mountains, there are a number of national parks you could have visited. Right. And so I wanted to kind of capture the and point out the silliness and the absurdity of the five-star scale while also being like fairly earnest in my attempts to figure mm -hmm. out what I do think about something on the whole. That's what I was wondering is how seriously do you take the the rating that you're going to give something, let's say it's Diet Dr. Pepper. Mm. I mean, not that seriously. For instance, I can't tell you for sure what the rating of Diet Dr. Pepper in the book is. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are a fan. Oh, yeah. I do love it. I don't you know, know if I said That's an like, amazing forced... story. I do love it. It's it's incredible. I mean, the the story, the Diet Dr. Pepper essay was actually the very first one I wrote. And I I kind of tried to write it as like an objective expert, you know, sort of a Malcolm Gladwell type, like looking down from on high at the world of Diet Dr. Pepper. <laughs> and it is a fascinating story. I mean, it's a, like most sodas, it was invented by a pharmacist and it was sort of a drug, you know, like all those early uh, sodas were sort of, and kind of still are, like with all yeah. the sugar and caffeine. And so I was writing this story and, and then I showed it to my wife, Sarah, and she said, you know, this is nice and it's funny and everything, but like you have written 1500 words about Diet Dr. Pepper and not mentioned that you personally love Diet Dr. <laughs> Pepper. And there is no like disinterested observer in this story or in any story. Mm -hmm. Like everybody comes at something with a perspective. And Sarah helping me to understand that was really critical to the book that I eventually wrote. You know, you say something at the end of that piece about Diet Dr. Pepper that I don't have it right in front of me, but it was a it was talking about vices. Yeah. And 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 how well, first of all, you know, Diet Dr. Pepper is a vice for you maybe now that you don't smoke cigarettes or whatever, but the specific part that really struck me was talking about how we sort of um the excitement around knowing that you're doing something that's bad for you is really yeah. part of the thrill of a vice. And as a person who is riddled with vice <laughs> myself, I'd never thought of it that way. Uh, that really changed my perspective. Yeah, I, I think I smoked cigarettes compulsively for a long time. And I would often think about why am I doing this? You know, like it's one thing to smoke five or 10 cigarettes a day, but when you're smoking 40 or 50 cigarettes a day, it's about something other than nicotine. And I think for me, it was about the, you know, I, for whatever reason, I've always felt this urge to self-destruct in, 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 in some way. You know, it, it goes back to adolescence for me. I've, I've always struggled against self-destructive urges. And the pleasure in smoking for me was in giving in to this, mm -hmm. you know, this, this compulsive need. Um, and I don't smoke anymore. I don't, I don't drink to excess. Um, but God, I love Diet Dr. Pepper. <laughs> <laughs> um, the chapter of this book on the yips jumped out at me because I'm a baseball fan and I've always been really fascinated with this phenomenon. For people yeah. that are unfamiliar, can you kind of describe what the yips are? Sure. I mean, I can describe it through the most famous example. On October 3rd, 2000, one of the best pitchers in baseball was a guy named Rick Ankeel and he was pitching in a uh, playoff game and he threw a wild pitch, something he'd done two or three times that season. And then um, he threw another wild pitch and then he threw another and then he threw another and he never regained his control again. He never became an elite pitcher again after that moment because he had developed the yips, which is a poorly understood, but we think it's mostly a physiological problem that is an actual sort of dystonia in the muscles. And so when he would throw, he would feel this little focal dystonia that would affect uh, his control. And that's such a fascinating word in the context of baseball. We hear that all the time about pitchers, like this guy has amazing control. And you know, control is what we all want on some level, not just pitchers, but all of us. And to lose that all in one moment and to never be able to get it back is not just a threat to your livelihood. If you're a professional athlete, it's also a threat to your identity. I mean, Rick Ankeel had never been anything but an elite pitcher from the time he was eight or nine years old. He was, you know, he defined himself primarily as a baseball player. And to have that taken away all at once is such a difficult thing. But the beautiful 
astonishing part of Rick Ankiel's story, and this is also true for Anna Ivanovich, another athlete who experienced the yips who I write about in the book. The, the amazing thing about their stories is that even though they never recovered the ability to do the thing that the yips took away from them, they were able to completely rebuild themselves and rebuild their game so that they can again become elite athletes. Like the, the last time a, a major league pitcher won 10 games and hit 50 home runs was Babe Ruth until Rick Ankeel, who dropped all the way down to the bottom of the major leagues, worked his way back up as a hitter, and then had a second really successful career as a hitter and replaced Babe Ruth as the most recent person to win 10 games as a pitcher and hit 50 home runs. And for me, that story is so much about what I love about humans. Like we do not know when we are licked, we keep going, we persevere. And I just, I love that about us. I also really like, John, that for what a obviously smart person you are and how much important information you have, you also love sports, which I feel I, like yeah, I can't those Venn myself. diagrams don't always overlap because sports are meaningless. What do you quote uh, Pope John Paul as saying about, about uh, football? He says about uh, world football, to be clear, what we call soccer. He said, well, it actually, I'm not sure that he said this, but it's one of those things that like he might have said, you know, yeah. so yeah. full disclosure, he might not have said it. But it's a great line regardless of all the unimportant things. Football is the most important. And right. that is what I think about sports. Like they don't matter. But the whole reason they matter is because they don't matter. You know, you, you write in the book and you've talked a lot uh, on various shows that you've done about your anxiety and ways that you will have intrusive thoughts later about interactions you've had with people, whether it's fans or whether it's people you're a fan of. I'm curious what it's like for you to do. You know, you're doing a publicity tour for this book. You're going to probably do 100 of these interviews. Do these interviews generate a lot of possibility for you looking back and feeling not great about how it went? Yes. Uh, yes. This one's, no one's going ever... well. I just want to say yeah, for we, the Yeah, we record. rated five stars. So. Take this yeah. one off the list. John <laughs> Green, five stars. Live you know, Warehouse Party. Nobody's ever asked me that question before, but it does in a big way. It's really hard for me. And after we finish this, I'll, I'll hyperanalyze. I mean, I think a lot of people do this, but I'll hyperanalyze my answers and I'll feel really unsettled about it. And I'll wish that I'd said something with a little more clarity or a little, you know, a little more carefully. Um, the pleasure of these interviews from a listener's perspective is is the unguardedness, right? It mm -hmm. is the openness. It is when the interviewer um, cracks you open a little bit and, and you become your real self and somebody can glimpse that. But that's also kind of what's terrifying about doing it because those are the moments when you're maybe not as careful as you should be or you're maybe not as precise in your language as you want to be or whatever. And so I'm sure I will. Um, but that's to be clear, like that's not your fault. And it's not, it's not even, it's, it's nobody's fault except for the fact that I have OCD. So like, I don't need this to have intrusive thoughts. So like, <laughs> I, I was going to, I was going to have them today anyway. Um, I was going to, I was going to have OCD regardless of whether we were doing this interview. And that's part of what I tell myself when I get ready to do something like this is like, well, you had OCD yesterday and it wasn't fun and it's probably not going to be that fun today, but you're also going to have it tomorrow. So like, <laughs> just do your best. That makes me wonder, does it, is it a solace to write then? Because the yes. line is polished and you yes. can... That's exactly right. Mm. That's and exactly it. Both genres, the fiction and the nonfiction? It, the it is it is a solace. And it also, you know, especially when I'm when I'm writing fiction, I it feels like almost like I can escape myself. Almost like I'm not stuck. I mean, one of the big problems with my particular um mental illness is that I really don't like being inside of the same body. I don't like being inside of my body. Like I, I, I have a lot of fears about contamination and it's, it's horrifying to me that like half the cells inside of my body are not actually mine. They're bacteria colonizing me. <laughs> and so I like writing fiction partly because it feels like an escape. It feels like, oh, I'm not going to imagine what it's like to be me. I'm not going to have to try to think about what it's like to be me because I can imagine being this other person. But I also do like writing because of the precision of it. That said, like the moment something gets finished, like now this book is is it's it's out, it's well, it's real, it's physical. I can't change anything about it. I immediately start to worry um, about about it. So, 
I don't know. I, I mean, in the end, like the way to to manage mental illness is to manage it, is to, you know, to tr- or for me anyway, is is to treat it, to take it as seriously as I would any other chronic health problem um, and to understand that it's something that I'm going to live with, but I can still have a good life. And but I do I do love the writing parts of writing because um, I get I get to think hard about what I want to say and I get to think hard about what I actually think about something and for me, writing and reading have always sort of been like the way that I have thoughts. Like I don't right. know, I don't really have thoughts outside of them, yeah. uh, outside of language. I just never knew when I was going to be kind of emotionally <laughs> knocked over by a particular yeah. chapter or a line. Like just this book really made an impression on me. And the podcast of the same name, The Anthropocene Reviewed, is also great. Would recommend both of them. Uh, John Green, thanks for coming on the Livewire House Party. Oh, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.